So I want to start out this morning. Uh, oh, I wasn't prepared for this. Apparently, it's an emotional morning for me right now. I want to start off by saying thank you. Um, I've told this story to a few people so far. Uh, hopefully, the details haven't changed too much as I've told people what's going on. Uh, but it's a story that I think bears repeating. So back at the beginning of December, or sorry, beginning of December, wow, that would go, be going, anyhow, never mind. I'm going to pull it together, I promise. Back at the beginning of September, uh, a friend of mine uh, from, a, a, a dear, dear friend of mine from back in Devon uh, reached out to me and asked me if I would be available to attend a prayer retreat with him. And being the incredible spiritual leader that I am, the first response that I gave in my mind was, absolutely not. Uh, no, I can't, I can't do that. I can't be away on a Sunday. People rely on me too much. I'm the preacher. I've got to be here all the time. And uh, he asked me, in his wisdom, thankfully, to pray about it and think about it for a while. And at one point, I brought it up with a couple of people around here who basically told me, you realize this place existed before you came, right? And you realize it's probably going to continue existing once you're gone. Get out of here. It was a gentle reality check, and it gently reminded me that this place, like I said, was standing long before I got here, and it'll be here long after, and they have offered to uh, put things in place that would allow me to spend some time uh, seeking after God intentionally, out of the grind, out of, uh, out of the ministry cycle, just to get away for a minute and just reconnect with God, which was something that was sorely needed uh, over the last little while. So I just want to say thank you to everyone here because anyone who I've told this story to has been overwhelmingly supportive, and I do appreciate that because it breaks me out of my, uh, my little anxiety bubble where I believe that I am uh, indisposable around here for some reason, and that puts a lot of, I put a lot of pressure on myself in that way. You've reminded me that I am dearly loved, and I do appreciate that, but there are other people here that I can trust. So thank you for that. I uh, just want to offer this out there. If anybody ever wants to hear anything that happened while I was away, because it was a time where I, I do know that God spoke to my heart, that there was a ministry of the Holy Spirit going on in that time. It was necessary to get away. It was necessary to enter into silence. It was necessary to enter into a place of prayerful isolation. So if you want to hear about anything that happened during that time, I would love to share it with you. Uh, doors always open. So the invitation is out there. That's the awkward emotional stuff out of the way. Let's get to the sermon, shall we? As we've been making our way through the book of Nehemiah, uh, we've been looking for what it has to say about the nature of revival and renewal. Revival and renewal, revival and renewal. You've heard it so many times since, since September. This is what we've been seeking after. Because the story itself is dominated by the reconstruction of Jerusalem's walls, it can be tricky to determine what it has to say to us now. Uh, I've had a few conversations from some people who, uh, as we're going through this, have been very generous in saying that, well, Nehemiah has been a bit of a slog for me in the past because it just doesn't really connect with me. I'm not sure how this construction project really speaks to my spiritual life. The story is dominated by the reconstruction of Jerusalem's walls, and like I said, it can be tricky to determine what it has to say to us now. So obviously it has a lot to say about leadership and determination and even prayer as we pursue God, and those are things that are good to dig into and understand. However, like I said, I've spoken to at least three people so far who have said that until now the book of Nehemiah was difficult to read because it's how procedural it is. Or how it just seems to be this record of this construction project. And that's why I love digging into this kind of thing intentionally because we get to discover together the layers of truth and wisdom that are waiting for us in God's word. In 1 Samuel 16, it says that God sees past the things that people focus on and he looks at the heart of a person or people. He sees everything that we do. But he also has the, sorry, 
He sees everything that we do, but he also has the wisdom and power to drill down to the root of all things. He sees all the surface stuff that goes on in our lives, but he has the power and the wisdom to drill down and see the root things that have taken hold in our hearts. The story of Nehemiah is more than just a story of how, against all odds, the walls of Jerusalem were restored, even though that's an incredible story to dig into. It's a story of how God invites his people to look past what is on the surface and rebuild from an even deeper foundation. The people needed to experience revival and renewal in their hearts. Then they would see the restoration of their city. I believe in the same way that God's word is speaking to us, that as we seek after change in our community, as we seek to reach out to others, as we seek to see a work of God happen in our time, we need to reach back That revival and renewal need to be made real in our own hearts before we'll see a change in the community around us. We spent the better part of two months looking at this, so if you've missed any messages along the way, I want to encourage you to go online and check them out. Uh, We've designed this to sort of build on itself and uh, think that uh, it's actually worked pretty well, so a bit of a humble brag there. For today, we've come almost to the end of our journey following Nehemiah and the people from crisis to crisis. And now we're in chapter 12. And I know that Jim was in chapter 5 last week, and it feels like we'll get there. Don't worry. But Today we're in chapter 12 where the walls have been restored, the people are gathering together, and we read this in verse 43. So Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 43. We'll be reading out of the NIV today. It says this. And on that day... They offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. An incredible noise of jubilation, joy, and celebration coming from this place that not too long ago had been in absolute ruins. When the work was done, The people gathered together to celebrate what God had done among them. Now the work had been hard and there had been many obstacles and challenges and threats along the way, but after decades of living exposed, vulnerable, and ashamed, the people of Judah had a reason to sing praises again. God had done a mighty work among them. And they had been restored in so many ways, not just the walls. We'll get into some more of the details in a minute, but for this morning, I want to draw your attention to this principle from here. It's good to celebrate the things that God has done in our lives. When we take time to look back and celebrate God's goodness and his faithfulness in the past, it helps to build our faith as we look forward to what it is that he wants to do next. I'll say that again. When we take time to look back and celebrate God's goodness in the past, it helps to build our faith as we look forward to what he will do next. Now, the process of revival and renewal is difficult, and I hope you've been tracking with me as we've gone over the reasons why it's difficult. Revival and renewal go so much deeper than the surface level. It wasn't just about the walls. Hebrews 4.12 that says that the word of God is like a sword that cuts through bone and spirit and down through the, to the deepest desires and thoughts of people. As the people of Israel celebrated that day, they were not just celebrating the rebuilding of a city. They were celebrating the renewal of their relationship with God. As the people of Israel celebrated that day, they had more to be thankful for than a wall. They had gone through revival. Let me take a few minutes to put that into a little bit more context. Now last week, uh, we were in chapter 5, and Jim shed a lot of light on how Nehemiah had discovered and opposed the oppression that was going on in Judah. It was the last heart obstacle that stood in the way of the restoration. 
you want to hear a little bit more about that, you can go back to last week's sermon uh, just as a little catch-up. Essentially, what it was was the people who were doing the building were being severely uh, burdened by the project. The people above them were uh, taking taxes on loans that they had set out, and people were having to sell their children into slavery. They were selling off all their land in order to just make ends meet. And like Jim said last week, Nehemiah, when he saw this, he did something that all of the armies standing around Israel, all the nations and all the opposition standing around Israel could not do. He stopped the work so that they could take care of something that needed to be purged from their community. You cannot build this wall on oppression. You cannot do this. You need to live up to this standard that God has given us. See, that was last week. It's a fair, hopefully, Jim, is there something you would add to that? That's okay? I'm getting a pretty good nod from Jim. I think I'm safe. In chapter 6, we're told about what happens after this, this happened. In chapter 6, we're told more about, about more opposition to the work, how more enemies kept on wanting to stop the work, but how despite the difficulties, we read that in chapter 15, the walls and the gates were finally and fully restored against all odds. Jerusalem had been rebuilt. It took 52 days from start to finish. I got a deck that I've been working on since last year. That was amazing for them to accomplish this. This wall was not just like a little picket fence either. This is a two meter thick, 50, or 12 meter high, and one mile long wall around an entire city. In 52 days to restore the incredible destruction that had been done on it. It was miraculous. And the rest of the book, after we see that the wall had been completed, records the families who returned to the region from exile and the process that the people went through of rediscovering the law as Ezra and the priests preached and led them into a new season of repentance and revival as they dedicated themselves to their covenant relationship with God again. It was a time of severely mixed emotion for them. Because on the one hand, they were experiencing an incredible time of renewal. This was amazing. People were coming back from exile. The land was being filled again. Captives were being set free. And the word of God was going out. It was amazing. But they were also grieved by the teaching of the law because it highlighted just how far they had strayed from their covenant promise as a people. It says in chapter 8 that the Levites had to calm all the people, saying, be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Guys, you got to calm down. Like, can you just be happy for a minute, please? This is incredible. I know that this is hard to hear, but just celebrate for a while. And after that, we return to some of the nitty-gritty details of the, pro- of the process throughout the next chapters. The city got repopulated and the temple got restaffed. And finally the day came for the work that had been done for the walls to be commissioned. The day finally came where they could call all the people from around the region to come together. Invite them to come to see this dedication ceremony where they would celebrate God's faithful provision for them. It was an incredible day. You might have noticed throughout this series that I really lead into these words, revival and renewal. It's because I believe that they're the focus of this story, and I think that the progression of the restoration project actually tracks with what God was doing in the hearts of the people the entire time we see it go through. It was obvious from the start that something needed to happen. In the same way that the walls of the city were in ruins, the people of Israel had been defeated and scattered far from their home where they were in desperate need of restoration. And it all came down to this broken relationship that they had with God. They had walked away from their covenant relationship with the God who had called them to be a nation that shows other nations what it looks like to follow him. 
And knowing the history that led to Jerusalem's downfall, Nehemiah decided, Nehemiah decided that any attempt to restore the city using his personal power and influence would just lead back to more ruin. We've seen what that looks like. It just re- leads back to this. So to face the crisis, he went to his knees before God to repent and ask for a renewing work to be done in the hearts of the people and for the restoration of the city. Straight to his knees in repentance. As Nehemiah shared the vision for the city that God had given him, ordinary people started doing the ordinary work of rebuilding a wall for an extraordinary purpose. As God moved through them, he united them. And the work moved on. When opposition rose up and the people were frightened and discouraged, they discovered what it meant to trust God's sovereignty as they remained engaged in the task at hand. And again, Jim shared last week how Nehemiah halted all the work on the wall to confront the injustice and oppression that was being laid on the working people by the leaders of the city that And that once the people didn't have to worry about selling their children or paying their debts to keep from starving, progress on on the work continued. Once the hearts of the people were lined up again, the work continued. By the end of this restoration project, the people of Judah had come through much more than building a wall. They had been freed from the sins of their past. They had been delivered from the hands of their enemies. They had been freed from the bondage or from bondage and reconciled to one another. And they had rediscovered what it meant to live in obedience and relationship with their God. They had not just seen the rebuilding of a wall, they had experienced an entire revival from the ground up. Their city and their hearts had been renewed. And on that day, they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard from far away. After having gone through so much that was difficult, tense, dangerous, and heavy, they'd finally seen and achieved the vision that God had given to Nehemiah. They had rebuilt the city and in the process they had rediscovered their purpose as people. Sorry, they had rediscovered their purpose as a people. And now that the work was over, it was time to look back at what God had done and to celebrate the incredible things that they had seen happen among them. And this is where the connection comes in for us today. Much of what we've talked about in this series has been about the hard work of revival and renewal. It's been heavy. Now, I truly believe that the things that God wants to do in our church are not surface-level changes. He doesn't just want us to repaint. He doesn't want us to go and start some sort of, like, weird program. He doesn't want us to just throw a new sign out front or something like that. I truly believe that the things that God wants us to do in our church and in our own lives are beyond surface level changes. When God calls us people to revival, it's a call to look beyond symptoms and get to the heart of what needs to be renewed. I'll go back to that Hebrews passage again. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. It doesn't just nick the surface. It gets right to the core of what's going on. Thoughts and attitudes of the heart are an intimate place. And the work needed to, be con- or needed to do to be conformed into the likeness of Jesus, I'm going to take another, is difficult. 
Thoughts and attitudes of the heart are an, intip- are an intimate place, and the work needed to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus is difficult. That is true. and I've done my best to not undersell the reality of that work, possibly to the point where it feels overwhelming. And if you felt overwhelmed at any point during this, please be encouraged. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. However, I believe wholeheartedly that when we are faithful to follow the lead of Jesus, especially in the hard things, especially in the things that are so intimate and so close to the heart of us, trusting that he loves us and that his purpose is to prosper us and not to destroy us, he or we will be led into a fresh experience, a new freedom that we have not experienced before. Salvation that we've experienced is one experience of freedom, but God is infinite, and God is good. God is infinitely good. And because of that, there is always more of him that he wants to give us, more of him that he wants, to us, wants us to experience, more of ourselves that he wants us to hand over to his spirit, the work of his spirit in our hearts. There is more freedom. There is more joy There is more to be experienced. We are never done experiencing a new goodness of God on this side of eternity. Now, I've been learning about this kind of freedom more and more lately. It's been a very personal journey as we've been going through this. One thing that you find out early on in ministry is that you can't preach on something unless you're experiencing it yourself. As we've been going through Nehemiah together, I've often been confronted by the Holy Spirit on the places in my heart that are in need of revival and renewal. And I think I shared a little bit of that this morning, just at the very beginning. And while I'd love to stand up here and tell you how simple it was for me to accept that, thank you, God, for showing me that truth. We're all done with that. We'll move on to the next thing. The truth is that I've discovered more about the ways that I've resisted God than the ways that I've been working with him. It's been hard. When you're confronted with something like that, your first response is, uh, it doesn't line up with what I want. Turns out it's the truth, though. I know exactly how difficult it is to have God present me with the pride and the fear that, I, that live in my heart. This has not been an easy few months for me because the work that needs to be done in my heart is extensive. And I'm not going to claim that everything is fixed because I believe that God is not done with me yet. But I will say this. When I consider the ways that God has been changing my heart through the ministry of his word, through the godly wisdom of trusted mentors and friends, and by the working of his spirit in me, I can see more clearly the things that I have lived in bondage to. I can look back and I can say, why did I allow myself to go there? I can see clearly what it is that God has released me from. Again, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. Just as as a younger man being called, who's been invited to come and be a pastor at this church, I have lived with a real fear that I'm out of my depth and that because of that, I might be rejected. It's nothing that anybody here has done. Please don't hear me saying that people here have been like cold or distant or anything like that. That's not the point. This is not about you. This is about me. (laughs) Where have I heard that before? But a fear that lives inside of me that I will not be enough. It's a fear that's built up a frantic spirit in me that has been damaging my connection with God and my, tr- or my, my connection with others and my trust in God. There's been a slow, steady work of renewal that Jesus has been doing in my heart. And I can tell you that from this experience, I am now walking in a fresh kind of freedom. Not a complete freedom just yet. We're working on it. There's a lot of growing up to do yet, and that's okay. But I can tell you that there's 
this new experience of walking in this fresh kind of freedom that has been growing more and more. The frantic and insecure spirit that is being washed away bit by bit to make room for the Holy Spirit to dwell in those places. To make it so that I can, by his power, trust others. To make it so that by his power I can see that I can trust him. Looking back on it, I can celebrate the work that Jesus has been doing in my heart and it gives me greater confidence in what he will continue to do into the future. On that day, they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard from far away. When we take the time to look back and celebrate God's goodness in the past, the things that he has been doing in our hearts, even just to, th- to look back and see the ways that he's been making changes, just recently even. It helps to build our faith as we look forward to what he will do next. As we move into communion together today, I want to invite you to meditate on this thought. The finished work of Jesus on the cross gives us the hope of heaven to look forward to. Now, that's an amazing gift. It's something that we hold to. It's an incredible truth that he's given us. But Jesus also offers us freedom from the burdens that we carry now. This is not just about after I die, I die, everything will be fixed. Jesus wants freedom for us now. I'm going to ask that you would take some time to think, think on the things that Jesus has freed you from and let that build your confidence, build your faith for the next thing that he wants to lead you into freedom from. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for who you are and what you've done. And God, even as we think on the things that you have set us free from, We ask, God, first and foremost, that you would bring those things to our minds, that you would show us the ways that you have been good to us. And God, let us never be content with where we are. Let us want to continue to strive, to move forward, to experience more and more of what it is that you have for us, to experience more of you, to be further and further conformed into the likeness of Jesus. God, that we may experience the freedom that you have to offer, the joy and the freedom that you have to offer so that, God, as we meet others, Lord, we can have that authentic witness of what you have done in our lives. That, Jesus, as people meet us, they would see the joy that you have brought us. That you are living and active in our lives. And that we look forward to what else you will do. And by that witness, God, that others would be drawn into a relationship with you. That others would be drawn into your kingdom. That your kingdom would advance. That your justice would advance. That your love and kindness and your salvation would advance. We ask God again that it would happen in our hearts first so that it can spread out from here. We pray it, Jesus, in your name. Amen.